You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter M. Lewingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24 7. On December 22, 2021, the Burton Spear newspaper turned 53 years old. The Burton Spear newspaper is the oldest Black Power newspaper in continuous print. The Burton Spear newspaper was founded by Chairman Omalia Shetela, then named Joseph Waller, in 1968 in St. Petersburg, Florida first established as a newsletter produced on a mimeograph machine, the Burning Spear newspaper, or the Spear for short, became a full-spread newspaper in 1969. Dubbed the voice of the international African revolution, the Burning Spear newspaper has been the leading organ of political and material support for the oppressed and exploited people of the world, such as Vietnam, Iran, Mozambique, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Occupied Palestine, Zimbabwe, Occupied Azania, South Africa, Cuba, Venezuela, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Ethiopia, Congo, Walter Rodney's Guyana, Maurice Bishop's Grenada, and everywhere else colonized and oppressed people have struggled for liberation. Even after the military defeat of the African Revolution of the 1960s, it was the spear that gave clarity to the African liberation struggle, as well as the international struggle for self-determination of African people. Mexican indigenous activists in San Diego, California, and other parts of the southwestern United States gained clarity in their struggles for self-determination amidst the onslaught of ideological imperialists by reading the pages of the burning spear. It was in the early 1980s in a London bookstore organized by members of the African anti-colonial organization, the Black Liberation Front, that Chairman Amali Chatella encountered a man with a burning spear in his hand, holding shop, and explaining the importance of the burning spear to other listeners. It was in the streets of Paris that Secretary General Louise Kinshasa first encountered a burning spear publication, the book Reparations Now which began his more than three decades of participation in the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhura Movement. The oldest institution of the Uhura Movement, the Burton Spear newspaper predates the formation of the African People's Socialist Party by four years. The African People's Socialist Party was formed in 1972 with the express goal of reviving and completing the African Revolution of the 1960s, the Black Power Movement. The Burning Spear did this through a dialectical engagement with the African liberation struggle. This is evidence from the earliest edition of the Burning Spear to the present. The Burning Spear waged important political struggles within the African liberation movement and has remained an institution of dual and contending power in opposition to the colonial capitalist base and its superstructure. The Burning Spear newspaper was the base through which an entire African internationalist media complex was formed. This includes a publishing house, audio, and visual communications. Today, we speak with the editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear newspaper, Akile Anai. Akile Anai is also the director of agitation and propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party. 
Akile oversees the work of print, audio, and visual media of the Burning Spirit Publications and Black Power Media. She also supervises the political education processes of the Uhuru Movement and co-hosts the weekly political study on Mali Tavi. Four years ago, in 2017, at age 21, and again in 2019, she ran for St. Petersburg City Council, the first candidate of any election internationally to run on the platform of reparations. Akile was featured in Ebony Magazine as a millennial of change. Welcome to the show, Director. Uhuru, thank you for having me. Uhuru, Uhuru, Director Akile. So, the Bernie Spear newspaper recently turned 53 years old. That is a phenomenal feat that has not come lightly. It is the product of struggle. The Burning Spirit was founded in St. Petersburg, Florida. It has been headquartered in many other places, such as Oakland, California, but has always returned home to St. Pete. Now, you were born and raised in St. Pete. Tell me, when was the first time you encountered the Spirit? And what has the Spirit meant to you throughout these years? I probably encountered it uh, well well before this period, but um, I joined the party when I was 18 following uh, graduating from high school and just entering into political life, into the work of the African People's Socialist Party. Studying the spear was a requirement So and selling the spear. So um, my first introduction, real introduction to the spear would have been at that point. And even, like I said, prior to just having... Uh, been around the Uhura movement, participating and volunteering in the movement prior to joining the party, just as a as a child growing up in the the presence of Chairman Amalia Shatella, being able to go to the Uhura House in St. Pete. Um, uh, so the spear has always been around uh, for me throughout much of my life, but a real, you know, concerted effort to actually read, study the paper, and understand its significance um, came <clears throat> when I joined the party in up 2015. And just in terms of, you know, how the, you know, the, what the spear has meant to me over the years, I continuously gained a deeper love and appreciation for the Burning Spear newspaper. It's not something that was inherent at first when coming into contact with it, but after, you know, many, you know, presentations of, 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 that the chairman gave around the significance of the spear and then being brought into the Department of Agitation and Propaganda and having to become the editor in chief of the newspaper, you had to really understand the spear significance. Otherwise, you really can't do this job right. And in it's like you have to understand the significance of the Burning Spear newspaper, its history, the pivotal role that it's played in, you know, con, uh, keeping the Black Revolution alive and, you know, consolidating the African People's Socialist Party and the African Revolution um, and the African the theory of African internationalism, which was developed by the chairman, also working alongside greats like Omawali K. Fing, who you know had this just deep love and who internalized the significance of the spear, um, in, in every every way possible, <clears throat> uh, Omawali K. Fing really embodied the spirit of the Burning Spear newspaper. So being able to work alongside comrades like Omawali and, you know, again, the leadership of the chairman. And then over the years, seeing for myself how the spear has played this role throughout history and and what it plays today, the role it plays today, as we continue to strive towards African revolution, the destruction of this social system, you know, my understanding of this of this paper and its significance continues to be deepened. As a native of St. Pete, what has the spear meant to the African community of St. Pete? What have you noticed about that? Well, I think the rich history of the presence of the Uhuru movement, the leadership of the chairman right here in this city is, you know, something that we can look at in terms of how the significance of the spear being right here in the city of St. Petersburg. Um, I just think it's captured within the overall history, the presence of of our movement. And, you know, the spear has been something that uh, because it's been headquartered here for so long and just knowing that the uh, founding of our Uhuru, of, of the Uhuru movement being in Florida and just our continuous organizing work that's happened here over the last several decades, you know, the spear has played just as it has throughout the world. It's a really important role here in St. Petersburg 
where it has informed the African community of who who we are and the situation within this city in particular. Um, you know, what's going on, being able to sum up the the characters, being able to, you know, say that the conditions that we experience right here in the city of St. Petersburg are directly connected to the conditions we experience as a whole, as African people under this social system. The spear has been a consistent force in summing this up, explaining the world and, um, you know, allowing for African people to understand our place in it and our responsibility. And so I think, uh, yeah, I would just say that the spear significance and what it's meant to the African community can really be seen and captured by the presence of the Uhuru movement right here in St. Pete and and the fact that St. Pete is a very special city because of the presence of the Uhuru movement. Um, it's not unlike any other place in the world that, you know, colonialism has ravaged. And in fact, the African community is experiencing, you know, this intense push out, uh, which, you know, we can call gentrification, but we know it better as colonialism today. The African community is under attack um, right as we speak right here in the city. But the fact is the African community is uh, more informed here um, than in most places because of the Spears' existence here in the city and the presence of the Uhuru movement, as mentioned over the you know last, well, five decades or more. Uhuru, thank you. So, Director Akile, 55 years ago, in December 1966, an important event to the founding of the Burning Spear was the tearing down of the George Snow Hill's racist mural that hung in St. Petersburg City Hall by Chairman Amali Chitella. Known as the first act of Black power, this act of resistance was widely publicized. Can you explain to the listeners how those actions by Chairman Amali Chitella, then the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in St. Pete, was more than an act of anti-racism, but was in fact anti-colonial? And how did this event influence the founding of the Burning Spear newspaper? Well, I would say first that the reason why the chairman ripping down that mural was an act of anti-colonialism. It's based on the fact that the mural hanging in the city government building of St. Pete was an act of colonialism in and of itself. It was an attack on the African community, this depiction. It wasn't just some, you know, this, it wasn't just some harmless um, mural that, you know, we can be embarrassed about or ashamed about, but, you know, all of that is contributing to this war of ideas that are imposed on our community how this definition of African people with, you know, these enlarged facial features and entertaining white beachgoers, that's not innocent. That's a total assault and reinforces the relationship that the colonizer has with the colonized African community. It was more than just a, a statement, um, but this was an understanding of how the white world understands the existence of African people, the subservient, you know, this clownish force, you know, that can just continue to be walked all over, exploited. And the, the justification of that reinforced by these ideas is a very violent piece of propaganda that hung in a government building. And that was an act of colonial terror against the African community. So when chairman tore that mural down, it couldn't have been an act of anti-racism because that was a, that was a, uh, that, that was an instance of colonialism. So the chairman tearing it down had to have been an act of anti-colonialism you know, so that's how we have to understand, you know, what the chairman uh, did, this first act of Black power that really catapulted the Black power movement of the 1960s, you know, really happening right here in the city of St. Pete as the chairman tore down that mural and not just tore it down, but marching through the streets. You see photos of the chairman dragging this mural down the streets of St. Pete, you know, coming into, um, con you know, into contact with the police um, in, in, a, in a whole struggle. Um, and this that was a really important act that the chairman um, carried out because it was the African community speaking for itself in that action. Um, and it was a determination that African people would never, ever be represented like this, be defined like this ever again without consequence. Um, and that we were going to define who we are uh, for ourselves and for the rest of the world. That's what the chairman did. And this event, you know, influencing the founding of the Burning Spear newspaper, I mean, and the fact is in 1969, which is where the first uh, official print edition of the Spear would appear, you had the cover being the mural, the mural that actually hung in City Hall, the mural that the chairman tore down. And, you know, this is obviously what three years later after the actual act itself um, had occurred, the Spear, the, that published 
was in December 22nd, 1969. So, you know, none of that was a coincidence. You have the chairman tearing this down in December of 1966. And then in 1969, we would have uh, the Burning Spear newspaper, which at the time was a publication of the Junta of Militant Organizations, JOMO, which was the organization that the chairman would very shortly after this incident um, would found right here in the city of St. Pete. And that was, a you know, the birth of an anti-colonial organization. So, yeah, I think that uh, what the chairman did in uh, 1966 would help to explain the basis for creating the Burning Spear newspaper and the fact that how does African people have control over defining who we are, controlling our own narrative? And that would be by having our own political journal. And the Burning Spear gave us the ability to, to do that, to begin to contend in this war of ideas and organize African people to our own interests. Yeah, who cool. no, I just really appreciate that, um, Director. I really appreciate that emphasis you put on colonialism uh, versus racism, and that you know tearing down the mural was was anti-colonial because the mural itself was an act of colonialism, an act of colonial terror, um, as you said. So I really appreciate that distinction you made, and uh, just the obvious connection between that and uh, the spear. You know, beginning this production shortly after that, or. Uhuru, uhuru. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well, Director Akile. I also appreciate uh, your delve into history because next year, the African People's Socialist Party will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. And as we've noted, the spear played an important role in the formation of the party and the revival of the African Revolution. You mentioned JOMO, the Junta of Militant Organizations. And that the Burning Spear was, in fact, founded by the Junta of Militant Organizations, JOMO, from which it takes its name. JOMO means Burning Spear in the Kukuyu language of Kenya. Now, why do you believe the Spear was such an important party-building institution? I believe that the Spear was an important party-building institution um, because, one, as we've noted, the Spear predates the party's founding. And the Spear played a huge role in consolidating the African People's Socialist Party and organizing forces um, with, you know, these understandings uh, that the Spear was pushing at that time um, and recognizing the need for a revolutionary political party, an adva a vanguard advanced attachment to uh, set us on the course of African revolution, um, you know, at the time where the Black Power movement was under assault and not just militarily, ideologically, politically, we were under assault and grasping at straws in terms of how to best sum up what it, what it was we were even experiencing and being able to, to plot the way forward. And so the uh, Burning Spear was really important in, in terms of developing the worldview, the understanding of um, African internationalism. What we know today is explaining the world from the point that African people uh, were, you know, colonized, enslaved by Europe, um, by Europeans dispersed throughout the world. And now we all participate in a system of colonial capitalism that was born of, at our expense. So, you know, this is the ideas, the understandings that the spear was in the process of developing, summing up. And as we uh, use the spear out in the streets, in the community to organize, you know, Africans into organization, because we were being pushed out by any means we were being pushed out. We were being thrown into prison. We were assassinated in broad daylight, our leaders being taken out right before us. And so um, as we were being pushed out of political life, the spear played this role of maintaining, you know, just the revolutionary fervor that was attempted to being, uh, you know, snuffed out by the U.S. government and uh, keeping African people connected to the African revolutionary struggle. So, you know, it was an important tool then to consolidate the African People's Socialist Party, to uh, revive the Black Power Movement of the 60s. And we see the evidence of this being an important party building institution today because the work of building the party has not stopped uh, as we enter into 2022. That work continues. The building the party um, is ever more necessary than it ever has been because we're right on the cusp of victory and um, the defeat of this social system is, is right in, in our grasp. So building the party is critical at this time and the spear is going to play the, you know, the same fundamental role it has um, since before the party came into existence. You know, that's why I believe the spear is an important party building institution because it's not just something that was important throughout history, but it's something that remains important today. 
Uhuru, so so I've read the eight years or so of the party leading up to the first Congress in 1981. Because of the military assault against our movement, a lot of functions of the party had to be conducted with the highest level of security in mind. Yet the party never went on the ground, nor did the publication of the Spear cease. In those years, the Spear really taught people how to struggle. It was, as Massimella might call it, a pedagogical tool. There are so many mass campaigns that the Spear reported on, which Jomo and the party led in, in the 1960s and 1970s. From the movements to Free Joe Walla, a.k.a. Chandler Mali Chatella, Connie Tucker, and Pitts and Lee in Florida, to the movements and struggles to free Desi Woods and to abolish the death penalty. What role did the Spear play in the mass movement of African people throughout the years? Well, as I've you know stated before, the, the Spear has been really important in being able to define the contradictions, the issues, and to keep African people connected with our struggle. And, you know, all of these campaigns are really important. And the fact that we have the spear to document that, to record this, but not just as a part of historical record that we were engaging in this, but this was to show the the Black revolution is alive and we're still here, that they didn't crush us. They didn't totally wipe us off the planet, that we are still here, we're still struggling. And to be able to produce this paper that was highlighting these campaigns, these anti-colonial campaigns, which were you know, playing the same role that the spirit was playing in terms of defining our reality, understanding the world. And it's not some, uh, these explanations that were being tossed around as a part of the counterinsurgency, as a part of pushing African people totally out of political life, confusing the revolutionary struggle as some, you know, some uh, fight against, you know, racism, the ideas in white people's heads. I mean, the spear played this role of combating all of these things and connecting African people to its own revolutionary movement. That's what the spear was doing. And and what all of these campaigns did, what the spear did, as I just mentioned, it was defining the world, our understanding, our relationship as a colon as colonialism, the contradiction being colonialism. The core of all of these campaigns we waged was the understanding that colonialism is the enemy. Colonialism is a thing that is responsible for, you know, uh, locking Desi Woods up, and colonialism is responsible for the fact that Desi Woods had to kill a white man in the first place to prevent herself and her friend from being raped. That's colonialism, and that's the violence that Desi Woods was experiencing, and the violence and attacks that African people were experiencing in the Pitts and Lee case, and all of these campaigns that we had waged was saying that. At this, we have to be engaged in anti-colonial struggle. And um, the spear, you know, the role that it was playing, again, connecting African people to these campaigns, to the anti-colonial struggle, calling African people to reject all of the mess, the explanations that were surrounding our movement at the time, reject that and understand that a fundamental contradiction that we are plagued with, that we are confronting, we are organizing against, is to overthrow the colonial domination of our people. And to, you know, reclaim our lives, our resources, our futures. And, you know, the spear was connecting African people all around the world. You know, you look at something like the Universal Negro Improvement Association um, that was led by Marcus Garvey and the Negro World newspaper and how it connected African people all around the world to this struggle. And you could say this: the spear was doing the same exact thing and continues to do the same thing where it's connecting African people everywhere to one struggle, one people, one party, one destiny, um, is is what the the spear has been doing since its since its founding and during that time, particularly in the '60s and '70s. Yeah, I mean, we were we were really suffering from this counterinsurgency, this ideological, uh, these ideological pitfalls, shortcomings, and you know, having to be able to understand what we even just experienced uh, uh, as a result of the counterinsurgency. The spear explained that all, and um, it made it was the lifeline. It was the lifeline that kept the African Revolution alive and kept the African masses connected with their own movement. Uhuru, uhuru, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Because now we have already touched on this, but let's go even a little bit more deep. A central tenet of African internationalism is that the primary contradiction that we as African people face is colonialism not racism. One attack that the African liberation struggle sustained during the 1970s was from the liberal left, or ideological imperialists, as Chairman dubbed them. 
They sought to redirect the African liberation struggle to be one against racism, to reform the U.S. And as a historian, I can tell you as a fact that the entire colonial capitalist superstructure, namely the university system, has attempted to crush the anti-colonial analysis that was central to the Black Power movement of the 1960s. Yet, one article that made its rounds in those early years was a document that came to be known as the Colonialism Pamphlet. It was a 1975 article in the Spear, originally entitled Colonialism, the Major Problem Confronting Africans in the U.S. In my research, I found that this pamphlet specifically and the spear more widely played a fundamental role in keeping alive the colonial question. Do you agree? In short, yes, I do agree that, um, you know, the spear has played a fundamental role in keeping alive the colonial question. And, you know, that's even evidence today as we see the, the question of colonialism, you know, being hotly debated, being mentioned in these major publications. I mean, this is these are things that they wouldn't um, have ordinarily been willing to say. But the fact of the matter is the spear has been pushing the, this line that the fundamental contradiction um, fa- that faces African people is colonialism. You know, the spear has been pushing this um, and, you know, for decades and being having the spear in the streets, selling the spear, having it being distributed all around the world. You mentioned earlier about how, you know, in in Europe, how the spear was being, you know, referenced as this important publication. I mean, this is just, you know, the the spear's reach throughout the world and how at that time we had been summing up that the the contradiction is colonialism. So, you know, absolutely the spear has played a role, um, as well as, you know, just generally all the work of the African People's Socialist Party. But the spear is something we can absolutely count on that is out there in the streets, you know, being able to uh, have African internationalism right at our fingertips by way of, you know, the nearest spear distributor, uh, you know, on our block. You know, that's that's what the spear has always done. It's it's made it cl- it's made clear that every problem and we would be writing about uh, specific problems. You know, there's a health care issue. There's, you know, uh, police violence or murder. There's, you know, ki- uh, the, the state sponsored kidnapping of African children. You know, all these contradictions. We wrote about them. We wrote about single cases. We we did all of those things. We had we made we waged major campaigns around those things. But every time the spear um, those articles were published within the spear, it was connecting that issue to colonialism. It was connecting every single thing that we experience as African people to colonialism. And, you know, that kind of analysis wasn't just something that you could pick up easily, but you could pick it up easily from, like I said, the nearest spear distributor on your block. You had access to that understanding, that worldview, that uh, explanation through uh, the spear. And the, and there's a reason why we reported on everything. That's why we documented our campaigns, our major successes. This is why we did all of that was because we were in the in the process of pushing this understanding that uh, that colonialism is the the core of the contradiction. And you know we see this again. We see this becoming you know just ever more clear as the you know the quote unquote mainstream picks up on this question of colonialism and and and. and and they are attempting to, you know, muddle it. They are attempting to redirect the struggle. But for the longest time, they were hiding behind this thing of racism that we have to um, be, you know, uh, try to develop an anti-racist society. And I don't know if they've ever actually claimed to try to do that, but just defining our reality as something limited to how white people, it's just white people are perceiving you a bad way and therefore that's why you experience what you do. And, you know, that's just the most backwards, you know, slap in the face to African people. Here we are 600 years dispersed all around the world, calling ourselves by all kinds of names and living in the most humiliating conditions, you know, experienced by a human being. And we're it's relegated to because white people got some bad ideas about who we are. And um, the Burning Spear has just totally, you know, been responsible for, you know, again, ha- allowing us to reject those ideas and being able to say we're experiencing colonial domination and that's what we have to fight against. We have to fight against struggle against colonialism. So, you know, as as uh, this the social system of colonial capitalism is having this quote unquote epiphany, um, we can say that it, it's no epiphany. This is as a direct result of the influence that the Burning Spear has had in our communities uh, for over the past five decades. 
Uhuru, Uhuru, yeah, thanks for that, thanks for that. Because, you know, in the 1980s, Chairman gave a speech at the University of California, Berkeley, entitled The Social Responsibility of the Spear. I really like that speech. I think it was reprinted in the book Black Power since the 1960s. In this speech, Chairman underscores a point that you just made. The chairman argued that the spear was not alternative media. It was instead an institution of dual and contending power. It is, in fact, that dual and contending power that I think now allows us to see the ideas encapsulated within the spear being given back to us within the analysis and the words of, you know, this uh, revolutionary uh, surge of the African working class taking place right now. So I really, really appreciate the point that you just made. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we're discussing the 53rd anniversary of the Burning Spear newspaper with Akile Anai, editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear newspaper. Ooh. So we've talked about the role that the spear played in building the movement for African liberation. What role does a spear play in building revolutionary cadre? Well, today, um, we look at uh, the forces, you know, who are leading the revolutionary movement today, the African People's Socialist Party. You know, we look at these leading forces who, you know, within our own organization, who were, you know, not just African internationalists overnight. We didn't come into the party just having this, this understanding of the world. In fact, we all came in with our own worldviews based on, um, you know, colonial capitalism and what we kind of adopted as our own um, navigating our way through this system. And the spear has, you know, played the role in building revolutionary cadre and one organizing African people into this movement, you know, maintaining this relationship uh, of the African masses to the African revolution And once those Africans, once we've entered into political life, continuously deepening our understanding and changing our worldview from one that supports colonial capitalism to one that supports the freedom and liberation of African people and and power into the hands of African workers. And so, you know, these understandings, again, were not just something we woke up with. We were just brilliant um, one morning, but the spear being in our communities, constantly providing this analysis, and then being something that is not uh, being something that we don't just put down when we enter the party. I mean, we, yeah, the party members we sell the spear, but we don't ever stop reading it. We don't ever stop writing for it. We don't ever stop studying it to sharpen our own understanding. So there's the ideological aspect in sharpening us as African internationalists, but also building revolutionary cadre means practical implementation of the theory and the work, and the most practical work of every party member is selling the spear. And, you know, you are forging cadre when you have comrades out there who go out and sell the spear, who organize their community, understand this as a weapon, continuously providing analysis for African workers in the process of transforming our communities into African, you know, internationalist, working class intellectuals, you know, constantly being in the process of doing that, that's going to forge revolutionary cadre. It's going to build local party units and organizations where we are. It's going to build mass organization where we are. It's going to bring African people into political life where we are organizing in these communities. And, you know, revolutionary cadre is forged by that person standing on the street corner, selling the spear and uh, winning its significance in our community. So the ideological and practical implementation uh, of the theory of African internationalism, you know, is, is uh, you know, how we develop cadre and the spear is just the thing that is constantly there as uh, serving the purposes of, you know, deepening our own understanding of the theory and requiring us to actually get out there and do the work and organize the revolution on the ground, because that's where it's going to be won. Oh, yeah, I really appreciate that answer. Um, you know, just as far as uh, the political understanding that comes with reading the spear and the ideological growth that comes with reading the spear and even just, you know, the practical aspect of being out there, pushing the spear, um, moving the spear. Uh, what would you say is, is important? Why would you say it's important for a revolutionary organization to regularly publish a journal that's accessible to the masses of African workers and peasants around the world? When I think about this question, I, I try to envision where mm-hmm. we would be as a party without the Burning Spear newspaper. Right. And 
it's kind of even hard to say that because the burning spear predates the existence of the African People's Socialist Party. And um, just to think back uh, to the, the statement about Marcus Garvey and the UNIA and, you know, at the uh, seemed at the height of um, that, uh, you know, that effort by Marcus Garvey, we had organized 11 million Africans. And this was all prior to, you know, having, um, you know, any any form of, you know, Internet uh, or, you know, being able to connect via social media, all the things that we have the ability to connect and uh, communicate with Africans today. We had the Negro World newspaper, which was something that was accessible by Africans all around the world. And it was this, as I mentioned earlier, about how the, bur- the burning spear, this lifeline, um, Africans around the world being able to see themselves represented um, in this paper and help and being able to say, this is what African people, this is what we have to aspire towards, this is what we have to fight for. And, you know, the Negro world just playing such a, an important role in, you know, just winning African independence. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it's no small feat to organize 11 million Africans all around the world prior to the digital era, you know, um, and the newspaper playing just that a pivotal role in that. And so I look at that example and, and look at the, the significance and importance of the party publishing the Burning Spear newspaper, never relenting, never letting it go, that we have to publish this paper, you know, and despite all circumstances, which, I mean, we face so many different circumstances and stuff that I've only just heard about, you know, by way of the chairman talking about, you know, what that was like, you know, publishing this spear. I mean, we, I mean, it was difficult circumstances. I mean, we had people who, you know, would sleep, you know, at like, as the as we're going into the height of spear production, you know, people are sleeping in the office, you know, waiting for their shift to, you know, do their portion of the paper. I mean, in distributing it in grueling conditions and figuring out how to just get it, you know, um, out into the community and dispersing it, not just within the U.S., but internationally having to be creative and um, uh, in dispersing this newspaper you know, we did that despite all of those conditions, the burning spirit continued to get out. But it's important for, uh, you know, our party and, um, you know, for any revolutionary organization who claims to be a revolutionary organization to have um, this journal, to have their own revolutionary journal as something that is not only chronicling or um, archiving its history, but continues to explain the world is a tool that can be used to organize our communities, an actual organizing tool, you know, and how can you do that? How can you do that without um, a revolutionary journal? Is your, are you going to be solely reliant upon the tools of your oppressor who can at any point in time, just take the rug right from under your feet? No, we have to have our own capacity to disseminate our own ideas. And uh, the burning spear has allowed us to do that for over 50 years. Uhuru, thank you. And just just coming off of what you said, um, just about the spear um, as an organizational tool. You know, the spear has always, always remained free to incarcerated Africans. So as the editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear, can you describe the response of Africans behind enemy lines inside colonial prisons? I mean, one of the things that just really deepened my understanding of the importance of this publication was the relationship that the spear has to um, the prisons and Africans being in prison and the fact that the spear, you know, being sent into the prisons um, and being um, available to our people behind enemy lines, behind these bars, it's a really important statement, I think, that the party is making that this is not a population um, where, you know, African people are, you know, forced into prisons and that's not, a, you know, that's not some uh, coincidence. And that's all a part of, you know, the counterinsurgency and making it so that African people are taken out of the this uh, revolutionary political life, preventing them from being able to organize against their own oppression. You, you know, you limit the ability for Africans to really organize and do that when you're stuffing us into prison and you're disrupting our whole way of life by forcing African people into these cages. And, you know, the African People's Socialist Party never discarded Africans thrown into prison never, never sees our people behind bars as some as a lost cause. Like, okay, well, that's that's the end of that. Like, no, we're organizing in those prisons. We're organizing organizing those Africans in prison, and we're developing African internationalists 
in those prisons and the burning spear getting into those prisons being something that is studied has been, you know, we get letters uh, to the office um, and letters that we publish in the, um, in the pages of the burning spear that have Africans expressing, you know, just their profound love and unity with the burning spear and our mission and the leadership of chairman Amalia Shatella. It has been a lifeline for Africans outside of um, prison walls, and it has been a lifeline for Africans inside. And um, I think even more so because the, you know, the expectation is that the African who's, you know, locked in prison, thrown in the jail, that's it. And that's the end of it. And we're saying we're going to turn those prisons into African internationalist universities um, where thought, uh, African internationalist thought is being discussed and, um, and being united upon within the prisons. And we can organize actual uh, party organizations, units um, in those prisons with, um, you know, willing forces behind the walls. So, yeah, I, I just think that our relationship to that whole struggle has was one of the things that really, you know, made me go, yeah, the spear ain't no joke. Oh, oh, oh yeah, exactly. The spear ain't no joke. That that could be a rap song. Uh, that that's that's excellent. That's excellent because one of the things that I was thinking about is that uh, some incarcerated Africans have referred to the spear really as a revolutionary bible of sorts inside uh, the prison. Um, I think it was Bakri Latunji, the Western Regional Representative of the African People's Socialist Party, who notes that the first time he had come in contact with the spear was when he was a young African hanging around the Black Panther Party headquarters, where they would pay young Africans to go out and distribute the paper. But later on in life, he had come across the spear when he was working as a nurse at San Quentin, and he passed the spear from uh, one incarcerated African to another uh, incarcerated uh, African um, at that time. And just the way in which they talk about, you know, the spear and the articles themselves being retained almost until uh, the the pages are literally crumbling, right? And and when the uh, Africans are released and paroled, they leave the spears, they leave the books on the prison block for the Africans to, who come after them to have that information. I know it was a guy by the name of Sayyika Shakur. Some people know him. Some people know him as Monster Cody Scott uh, from uh, Los Angeles who mentions that when he was incarcerated in the late 1970s and the 1980s, it was the writings of the party, uh, namely the burning spirit that had advanced his own political consciousness. He just passed away within the last year. Now, as a historian, I was stoked when I first learned about the burning spirit digital archive housed at the University of Florida. My research has always been influenced by chairman and the theory of African internationalism. But I promise, if that digital archive was available to me at the beginning of my doctoral studies, my dissertation project would have been vastly different, but that's a whole other story. Can you tell listeners about that project and where can they access it? Yeah, that that project has been, you know, just totally transformative. I mean, I see um, in the party, I think that people would express the same sentiment, Matsumela, probably not a dissertation project necessarily, but just, you know, being able to say, wow, like I have access to the party's history. And just a little recap, the University of Florida, you know, wanted to acquire the the spear in a digital library, making it accessible to, you know, their students and, you know, just the public who access, you know, go to this institution for information um, and research. And um, through the process of acquiring the um, spear into a digital library, um, we had to actually digitize it. And so um, their staff in their um, in that specific department, they, you know, got every issue of the spear, you know, that we had throughout history and they archive or they digitized every single one and then, you know, published it on their, their website. And I believe you can access it by going to ufdc.ufl.edu. And if you type in the burning spear, you'll be able to to find every digitized copy. So, yeah, that was it's just been really, uh, like I said, transformative. I mean, within our own movement, um, and you can see it 
you know, being referenced, being used in presentations and reports that are given today. And you can just tell that that's made such a huge difference. And as we continue to gain access to the party's history, uh, as we continue to digitize what we have within the archives, we allow for those who are coming or entering into political life to recognize the the shoes that they fill and um, the foundation that they they walk on. So yeah, that that was the project, and I think people uh, express the same sentiment, Montanova. Oh, 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 yeah, that archive has some real reach. In the past year alone, I've seen lots of references to the spear. Uh, the writings of Chairman Amalia Chatella and other campaigns led by the movement so much that we now see our ideas being told back to us. You even received specific requests to reference the spear and reprint items from the spear. How have you noticed the extended influence of the spear in recent years? Well, as we mentioned earlier about how um, even these quote-unquote mainstream uh, publications, these major journals and things like that, are talking about colonialism. I mean, that's just one example of how um, the influence of the spear, you know, you can see it uh, throughout, you know, because these understandings are, um, you know, being being founded somewhere. And it's it has been always available in the pages of the spear. And I think that, you know, we just will continue to see our ideas coming back to us because, you know, we're entering into this period now that the party has ushered in, that the leadership of the chairman has um, ushered in, and um, where people are looking for an exp- a concrete explanation that makes sense and that can really paint a way forward. And so, you know, as people continue to, to grasp for understanding, the spear, um, we'll see the spear and other publications, you know, from the African People's Socialist Party you know, will can will continue to be an influence um, in because, you know, as we're explaining this, people are coming to us, getting this explanation. And again, it's not something that is just, you know, people wake up one day understanding and have like, OK, well, we, we got all the answers today. Like it's going to be the publications, the distribution of the spear that's really helping to influence all, you know, these journals, even, you know, not just ruling class, uh, because again, they're going to take these ideas and as in, and they have to speak to them because it's the thing that is like the people are really struggling with grasping, you know, really coming into this understanding. So the ruling class media has to reflect, you know, this, this change, this shift. And, but they're going to do it in a, an attempt to redirect. And then there are going to be those progressive forces who are genuinely trying to understand the world. And African internationalism has been the only thing that has allowed them to have breakthroughs. And, um, you know, so we, we continue to see it uh, today. Like you said, it comes back to us. And, um, you know, as the urgency of this moment uh, continues to build, as the crisis of imperialism continues to be deepened, we will constantly see publications, writings, um, you know, reflecting, you know, the ideas and understandings that the spear has been pushing all this, all this time. Um, And, you know, we've seen not just colonialism being discussed, the question of reparations being highly debated and being, you know, understood as, you know, uh, more and more understood as not some poverty program, but, you know, something that uh, it means that you know the resources within the white world have been accumulated, amassed on on the backs of African people, and that those resources have to be returned. Like all of that, all that stuff that's coming back to us—that's the spear. That's African internationalism. That's the publications that we've developed over the years. You know, and being in the community distributing the spear. This is this is what you know. All these conclusions that these you know these you know brilliant forces are coming to today is you know because we've been out here doing this work for this long uh, with our own tools. So, you know, that's how I can say the, the different things that I've noticed. But, um, you know, it's, it's just that's just going to intensify. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we are discussing the 53rd anniversary of the Burning Spear with Akile Anai, editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear newspaper. Ooh, so, Director Akile, with the party's anniversary coming up, you have a lot in store. What can we expect from the spear in the near future? Well, I think one thing that we can expect from the spear and just this department 
is, you know, the continuous unveiling of the party's history, making that more accessible in the articles, in video, audio form, you know, really um, developing a process where the African People's Socialist Party, its membership and the, the whole African world and others, you know, will have the ability to uh, look at the party's history and, you know, just in, in terms of the spear specifically, I mean, we intend to uh, continue to get bigger and better. Um, you know, we want to obviously uh, publish articles that are happening, you know, throughout the world where we're organizing and preparing and celebrating for the 50th anniversary, um, using uh, the spear to, you know, chronicle moments in, in our our history, the like real highlight moments of the party's history. We want to use the spear to really highlight those things. I mean, we're going to be really pushing sales, the increase in distribution and the studying and the um, contribution to the spear in the forms of uh, writing. And so, uh, you know, the spear is going to just play a really important role in, in talking about this history, really telling the story. And that's what we have to do, you know, all next year and beyond. We have to tell the story of the history of the party and the spear is going to play a fundamental role as it always has um, in, in telling that story. Who director, looking forward to all that work that the spear has on its plate, looking forward to it, looking forward to everything uh, to come in the next year. So how can people get involved in the Burning Spear newspaper and other publications? You can learn more about the Burning Spear newspaper and our publications. You can visit the burning dot com and you know to find out to find where our publications are, you can visit burning dot com. You have been listening to Black Power Talks. Produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we discussed the 53rd anniversary of the Burning Spear with Akile Anai, editor-in-chief of the Burning Spear newspaper. To read the Burning Spear newspaper, you can go to theburningspear.com. And as noted, the digital archive is available at ufdc.ufl.edu. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something, was written and performed by Aliki Ngoma. Thanks to the Black Power Talks radio show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and Ahip Panda. Uhuru, I just want to appreciate Director Keyleth being able to participate in this episode with us. And I want to salute the burning spear. Keep the spear burning. Uhuru. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running
you a 